Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Business Profit Acceleration Group Coaching. Um, I am really excited to have our guest speaker, Janet Fish, today. She's going to talk about best practices for email marketing, which I think every entrepreneur that wants to grow their business needs to needs to do. I've known Janet since 2005. We became coaches together. We've been amazing friends and accountability partners for, I guess, decades. <laughs> almost, <laughs> a long time. Decades. She has, she's an expert at podcasting. Um, and as I said before, email marketing and, and uh, is an a incredible person and business coach. Let me read you her bio really quick. Janet is a reformed corporate executive turned serial entrepreneur. Janet has found her passion in coaching others. She's been coaching since 2005 and has worked with over a thousand entrepreneurs in 16 countries, helping them start or grow their business, make lots of money and invest if for long-term growth and security. Janet hold on, uh, is the host of Breakthrough Your Profit Ceiling podcast and author of the Amazon bestselling book, Quit Your Day Job, 10 Steps to Finding Financial Freedom, second edition. So please join me in welcoming Janet Fish. Hey there, how's everybody today? Great. Awesome. Great. Doing hey, well. Uh, I'm just going to start with thanks, Jim, for inviting me. Um, were you like the first Um were you episode one of my podcast? I'm trying to find which episode you were. Like, yeah, I believe so. I think the you were. The inaugural so. episode. It was like the, se- the first episode Jim was on the podcast. So go check that out. And he's been on um, a couple of others, most notably episode 92, where we talked about follow up. So if you want to go check out the podcast and Jim's been on a bunch of them, um, but number 92 was another one that's pretty good that Jim and I had a a chat talking about follow up. So um, anyway, thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'll just give you, I mean, Jim gave you my bio. I'll just tell you a little bit about my email marketing experience or how I became obsessed with email marketing. It was probably two, maybe even three years ago. Um, I was using MailChimp. Is everybody familiar with MailChimp or any of the other providers? Mm-hmm. Sure. And um, I just, and it was just, it looked outdated to me. And there were some certain things that were really hard to do. And so in my world, someone uh, recommended something called Active Campaign. So I ended up moving from MailChimp to Active Campaign. And when I did that, I rewrote all of my email automations. And so that's when I started talking about it because I wanted to learn as much as I could about email automations and how to really effectively use them. And then some, I was in a Zoom meeting that was probably in the Zoom days when we couldn't go anywhere. Um, Someone said, could you teach us that? So I said, yeah. And one of the things that I always do and I would would recommend that you do is I said, I will create a course, but I'm not going to create it until you buy it. So I said, I'm going to sell, I won't create it till I've sold five of them because I wasn't going to go off and create it and then have them come back and say, well, I'm not really interested in paying you for it. So I was like, I'm not going to create it until I have five people paid that have paid for it. Well, I got seven people to pay for it. So then I created the course and then I created a workshop, which is a live work shop where you actually um, come and actually work on, you learn best practices and you work on creating an email campaign. So I've just been obsessed with it. This is my year of email marketing. I'm doing a lot about email marketing. I find that it is the, I would say the biggest mistake that I see entrepreneurs make is not capitalizing on email marketing. I think email marketing is a great way you can make money while you sleep. And so I'm going to talk about that today. I'm going to, I guess I'm going to do a, 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 a uh, let me go to my desktop, share, and then let me bring up, if I can find my PowerPoint presentation. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. Hold on. It's, it's here somewhere. All right. So I'm going to talk about um, 10 steps to maximizing your email list. But before I do, can I ask a, like a, a question? Can you guys come off mute and kind of give me an idea of where you are with email marketing? Are you utilizing it? So I can kind of tailor 
the talk to where you guys are. So can you give me an idea of where you guys are as far as doing email marketing? I haven't even started yet, but I'm just back into real estate this last six months or so. Okay, great. I don't do but, any. Okay. Peers, we're all there. kind of beginners. <laughs> okay, good. Well, uh, Brent here. I've used email marketing for a number of years. I use GetResponse. So I've I've done uh, autoresponders and drip campaigns, but I, it takes a lot of work and effort for me to actually make a full campaign. So I, I haven't done anything on a large scale yet. Okay, great. All right, so we'll we'll start from there. Um, I can only see p some of you. I can't see all of you. So um, if you have a question, I would love this to be as interactive as you want it to be. So if you have a question, raise your hand. And Jim, can I ask you to monitor that for me or monitor the chat um, yep. so that if you guys ask questions as we go, um, I think would be would be great. And then I'll leave some time for questions at the end. All right, let me get this thing going. All right, so the step number one is to build your list through engagement. And so people always ask me, I, I get the idea that I need to build a list, but I don't know how to do it. And mm -hmm. I would say the way to do it is to talk to people, to go out and talk to people, have a plan for that, like have a goal of how many people you want to talk to, how many networking events you want to go to, or whatever form that you're going to use to build that list or to get out there and talk to people. But I would say have a plan for that. Um, figure out where your people are, right? So I, Jim and I are business coaches. We're looking for entrepreneurs. I primarily work with solo entrepreneurs. So I go to places where there are a lot of solo entrepreneurs, whether it's online or whether it's offline. So figure out where those people are and then hang out in those places. And like I said, have a goal and then be consistent with it. One of the things that I've learned over the years is one of the greatest traits of entrepreneurs is uh, being consistent. So have a plan for how you're going to do that and then be consistent with it. And I would say the other thing, so these are, I don't know if these are in chronological order, but uh, the other thing, once you have a list or once you've grown that list through your marketing activities, the next thing is to manage your list. And so a lot of us put it in a get response and an active campaign, some kind of an email service provider so that you can actually create those campaigns. And then it, I think it's key to really maximize that list is to segment the list, which means take your, you've got a main list of, um, of all of your contacts, but then put them in categories or mm. segments so that you know who they are. So that segment might be buyers. It might be for me, I have a, a couple of segments that are email marketing specific because that's one of the many things that I do. I've got a list that's people who have been on my podcast. So it's really powerful to uh, segment your list so that when you do send out emails, you send out emails that can be targeted to people who have raised their hand and said, I'm interested in X, Y, and Z. So really, really, really powerful way to organize your list of contacts is to segment into different categories, if you will. And then I would say the list is your gold. It is very, very powerful. It is an asset that you own. So if someone came to me and said, Janet, I'm interested in buying your business, I think the first thing they'd ask me is how many customers do you have? or mm -hmm. how many prospects you have, or how many people do you have in a database? If you don't have that, then you're at a disadvantage. Let's say I want to do marketing. Jim and I decide we're going to create this great thing together and we're going to go market it, right? Well, I am much more attractive to Jim as a marketer with a thousand person email list than I am with a hundred person email list. So it really is an asset that you can utilize um, in your business. So let's talk about the anatomy in a, of an email. This seems kind of obvious, um, but there might be a couple of gems here that you don't really know about. So the first thing is deliverability. 
So that goes to, do I end up in a spam folder? Do I end up bounced <laughs> because I have a bad email? So there are a lot of tools and things that you can do to stay out of the spam box or the junk box or wherever you might go. So you want to look at those things to make sure that your email gets delivered the way you expect it to get delivered. And then, of course, the from. And people don't really always think about that, but I look at the from. Sometimes I send it from my business. Sometimes I send it from Janet. And I make that conscious decision of where I'm going to send it from. Jim, I know, has a couple of businesses. So he might oh. think, do I send it from Peak or do I send it from Summit? Like, because people are going to, we want people to open it and the more powerful from that you have. So if people only know me as Janet, and then I send an email from Breakaway Business Coaching, which is my business, they, they're not going to open that because they don't recognize it as me. So that's a great thing to think about as you're sending out emails. Subject lines, no one, if you don't have a powerful, good subject line, no one's going to open your email. So really important to do something powerful that piques someone in someone's interest so that they actually open uh, the email. And then I, I, I don't know if you all see it in your email inbox, but underneath the subject line is a pre header. Got one today, so a lot of times you can add a second line of subject line that might pique their interest some more. A lot of the email service providers will take whatever's in the first line of your email and put that in the email pre-header. So keep that in mind when you're creating your emails. And then what's your design look like? Are they clean? Are they easy to read? Are they attractive? Um, that makes that does matter. And then of course, content matters. I'm a big component proponent of skimmable, easy to read bullet point types of emails. If I open up an email and it looks like the page of a book, I'm not going to read that. So that's just me. Know your audience. Um, but the content matters. Make it something that's interesting to them. Ask a powerful question or, um, or, and make sure that it is about them. Like, don't send emails that are all about you. People don't care about you till they care about you, right? So uh, make your content compelling content so that people are like, Janet always sends me really cool stuff. I'm going to open up her emails. And then the email header or the banner. I actually don't do a lot of email headers or banners, um, but that is something that you can add to maybe um, brand it with your logo or your colors or an image that makes it more compelling for people. And then the footer, most email service providers require that you have a, an unsubscribe button. A lot of them require that you have a physical address. So there are certain things you want to put in the footer that are required or your, and your footer could be a signature or it could be a link to go check out this really cool thing that I have. All right. I'm going to move along because I know I've got um, a bit. Okay. Let's talk about best practice. So this is one of my little pet peeves. I'll just be honest with you. Um, when I have a client who says I've got a box of business cards, or I went to a, an event and I met people and I got these business cards, but they never do anything with it. That makes me crazy. Like I'm so about email marketing. It can be a very easy thing to do. Um, but it's all about the follow-up. So I would, because let's face it, if you go and you meet somebody at an event and you don't follow up, they, they say, yeah, I'm interested in what you have. And then they don't follow up with you. You don't follow up with them. Then let's say a week later, you do follow up with them. One, they might not remember you. Two, you're going to have to have that initial conversation all over again because they're going to forget who you are because they probably met 10 people at or however many people at that event. So follow-up is really important. So the interest phase I talk about, uh, that's really the subject line. Like how do I get them to even open the email? That's got to be the interest part. So that's the interest phase. The hook phase is the content. So they've clicked and they've opened the email. How do I hook them in to get them to do what I want them to do? So what kind of compelling co content do I have in there that's about them, but about what they need to hook them in? And then the conversion phase is, um, did they do what you asked them to do? So it, and that could be um, asking them to go to a link 
to learn more. And that link doesn't have to be your website or your stuff. It could be outward somewhere else. It could be a link to opt in to get a free irresistible offer that you have. It could be a link that says, buy my book or uh, <clears throat> go listen to my podcast. A lot of my conversions are here. I, I send an email about what that week I talked about on the podcast. And then the conversion is link and go listen to the actual um, podcast episode. Let's talk a little bit about frequency. So frequency is kind of an, it depends um, answer, but I personally, this is my cadence for frequency. For someone who opts in to get my free irresistible offer, I send out a first initial right away, a thank you and a deliverable. So let's say they, they got a I have a one of my lead magnets is 35 ways to build your email list. So you want that. So you go and you give me your name and your email address. And I say, thank you for, you know, opting in to get the 35 ways to build your email list. Here it is. Right. So that's my initial email. And then I usually do a second email that first week. And then I do two emails the um, second week. And then I do one email a week after that. And I would say, I don't know if it's somewhere else in the present day, but I would say you real if you're going to do a drip campaign or an automation, it needs to be 10 to 20 emails, not one or two. Cuz the, the marketers say it takes 7 to 20 touches before someone's going to do what you ask them to do or buy something or get on the phone with you. So those email campaigns should be longer than just two or three emails. So it's two the first week, two the second week, and then one a week going forward. Length. I don't like super long emails, as I said, um, but know your audience. But I like short couple of paragraphs types of emails. Create great content. I'll, I'll say it over and over and over again. Um, that's what makes emails great is great content. Uh, use multimedia. So don't always send out just a text email, send out a video, send out text and a video, send out an image. So make sure that it, you you mix it up as you go. I'm also, because when I'm doing those long email campaign, drip campaigns, I will do a, one email in text about a certain subject. And then I'll do another, maybe even the next email on the same subject, but a video instead of text, because people learn differently. People like to consume information differently. So really mix it up and then always have a strong call to action and only ask people to do one thing because a confused mind doesn't buy. So if you ask them to check this out, do this, do this, do this, do that, I don't know what to do. They don't do anything. So make it a strong call to action and then only ask them to do one thing. All right. Um, creating great content. There's a couple of different types of email marketing campaigns. So the first one is a broadcast. So that would be something that let's say you're opening up a new product or you've got a house that's coming on the market. Um, so you would send out an email, broadcast email to everyone. That's kind of a one off email. Uh, weekly. A lot of us do a weekly newsletter or some kind of, a, I call it a value added weekly value add email. And I will just come clean. I try to do it every week, but it doesn't go out every week. So I'll just be honest about that. Uh, but I try to do a weekly um, email. So a lot of us do that. And then automation, which is that drip campaign. So automations are so powerful because you create them one time and they run over and over and over again. So for each of your free irresistible offers, you should have a drip campaign or an automation that automatically runs, that takes people on the journey that you want to take them on. And I don't have time to go into a lot more depth on that, but it's important to understand when you're writing those campaigns, what's the journey you want to take people on and map that out rather than just willy nilly have emails that go out. A uh, couple of email marketing examples are a welcome series, uh, something that's triggered as in they opted in for your free thing or they bought something that you have. So that would trigger a campaign. Uh, Re-engagement. Re-engagements are great. The power of email service providers will allow us to go in and say, Jim hasn't opened an email from me for six months. So I'm going to send and I can get a list of all of those people in whatever time frame I want. And I can send them a specific email that says, hey, Jim, you haven't opened an email in a while. I want to know what's going on with you. And I might even say, um, if you're not interested, 
feel free to unsubscribe because we pay per person in our database one um two if they're never going to open an email that hope that 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 affects our open rate which we care about um two they may be more likely to to report you as spam because they don't really want your stuff so there's multiple reasons don't get upset when you go in and you see that somebody unsubscribed um because sometimes we they're just people who aren't good prospects or customers for us so it's okay to just let them go and then the other ones are thank you delivery like i talked about when somebody opts in um they say thank you for getting the thing that you got and then you deliver it to them and then you give them some great content and then lastly make them want to open your email i know that sounds pretty obvious um but if they don't if they never open it then they're never going to get your great content um so just a, a little bit more on a, developing a strong uh, call to action like i said tell them what to do be really specific click here like with arrows and a button make it really clear that what what you want them to do. don't make it hard for them to figure it out make it simple and like I said, only ask them to do one thing. Don't ask them to do multiple things because like I said, a confused mind doesn't buy. Let's talk a little bit about email metrics. So I have clients who do email, but they never look at the metrics. So they don't know what's not working. So delivery rate, we talked about already. Did it actually get delivered? And did it get delivered to their it to their inbox, not their junk folder or their spam folder. Open rate is the percentage of people that actually open the emails that you've sent to. A, a, a typical open rate is 12, well, a good open rate is 12% or more. Like if you're, I, I usually get on my targeted emails, I usually get like a 30 to 40% open rate on a targeted email. My weekly emails, I'm at about 20, maybe 25. So those are good open rates. Th those are good rates. If you're getting a 10% open rate, that's not a bad open rate. So if you're looking at your numbers and you're saying, you know, only 20% open, that's a good open rate. So just so you know that you're not going to say, I need an 90% open rate because that's not realistic for, for, for a list that you haven't really worked to get the open rate higher. There are things that you can do to get your open rate to be higher. Click through rate. What percentage of people actually, so they, oh, I, had, I had a certain number of people open it. Now, how many people actually clicked through? Um, a complaint rate, which hopefully you never have to look at or, or, or see, and that is, you know, what, what percentage of people have actually complained about you? Um, I actually one time had a woman who opted in for my, she opted in for my thing, but I guess she didn't recognize it. And then she reported me as spam and then she bought my program and I called her. I'm like, well, why did you unsubscribe and report me as spam? And she's like, oh, I didn't know it was you. I was like, okay. She goes, can you, can you re put me in there? So I actually have that complaint. And then AB testing, which is um, one of the most common things that people AB test would be a subject line. So let's say you have 100 people in your database, you send an email to 50 of them with, with subject line A and 50 of them to, to, with subject line B, and then you figure out what, uh, what's more compelling, what has a bigger open rate, what has a bigger click-through rate. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about email automations. Let me check the time, okay. Um, it's an ongoing contact, right? So like I said, seven to 20 emails. So over the course of time, you're gonna drip that campaign to people who have opted in or have bought something from you. So, and it is, is a triggered event often, or you can actually just go and put people into automations. You build it one time and then it runs over and over and over. Every time somebody, opts in to get that free thing that you have or buy your book or whatever that is, th that automation will run and you never have to touch it again. Have a plan and I say, take them on a journey. So um, I want, I, I, I know what my end result is. So if someone opts, op, let's say they buy a book. I have a book, Jim's got books. I buy a book from Jim and Jim takes me on a, um, on a journey where the first email is like thank you here's the book and then the second email is here's how you use the book and then the, the next time maybe he takes subjects 
from each of the chapters and goes a little bit deeper in those emails. Um, but then he wants me to do something else, right? I bought a book from him. He wants me to join his group coaching program, right? Where, where you guys all are right now. So have, have a journey that you want them to go on. So you have an email, thank you for buying the book, and then some more emails, some good information. And then along the way, good content, good content, good content, good content, offer to buy, to, to sell them into your group coaching program or good content, good content, good content, good content, get on a strategy call with me. And then there's they don't do that good content, good content, good content, good content, and then ask them to do something else. So have a journey, know where you want to take them, know what your intended outcome is. All right. And then creating individual emails. So follow that plan. I would say first figure out what that plan is, how many emails you need to make, you need to create, and then kind of make a, a draft or a plan for that. And then go back and start writing each individual email, follow that plan, use multimedia, uh, follow best practices, and then reuse email copy. I do it all the time. So I have all of my emails print it out in a binder. And anytime I'm going to create a new email automation campaign, I go back and I peruse those and I see what can I reuse? What content can I reuse? Because you're going to have multiple email automations. And wouldn't it be great if you could utilize some of the content that you've already used in a different campaign? Then and then analyze. Yes. A quick question. This is yeah. absolutely incredible and a ton of va very valuable information. Um, when you talk about a plan, do you want to go just a bit into more detail? Like say if somebody buys something or doesn't buy or watches a video all the way through or doesn't uh, the sure. use of, of tags uh, and then you know, like getting the right message to the right people. Right. Perfect. So let's use an example of somebody who opts in for some free information. Right. So then I give them that free information and I thank them and then I start them on a campaign. Well, there's a couple of things you can do as Jim's really talking about the power of an email service provider. Um, so I send them an email. I can actually figure out who opened the email and who didn't. So part of what I do on the journey that I take them on is if they don't open it, I send them the same email the second day to only the people who didn't open it, right? So you have some powerful things there. Then they go along that journey and they buy a book. So first they opted for a free thing. Now they've bought a book. So now I tag them as a customer of that particular program. So you can add and, 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 and further categorize people and people can have multiple tags um, as they interact with you in different ways. I mean, I have people who have bought everything that I have and have opted into everything that I have. And I go into their record and they've got, you know, 16 tags in there because they've done everything. So each individual thing that you do, you would want to tag them as they're going through that journey so that you understand what they did and what they didn't do. Does that answer your question, Jim, or would you want me to go further? I think that's great for now. We don't want to go too far in the Yeah, I don't want to go too, too deep. That was that. fantastic. All right. Um, so figure out what's working, what's not working, like go back to those metrics and figure out if people aren't opening my email, that's one problem. If people are opening, but not clicking, that's a second problem. If people are opening and clicking, but not buying or doing what I asked them to do, that's a different problem. All of those are different things. So don't, don't solve a problem that you ha don't have, don't have, find the problem that you have and solve that. Uh, like I said, follow the metrics, incrementally test. Um, all right. So before I, so this is my email marketing automation workshop. Um, it's a half day. It is, uh, it's a Zoom workshop. We te I teach you email best practices. And then um, I send you off to actually create that campaign and to actually create the emails. And I give you some very powerful templates to use. So if you really want to, spend some time and actually dive deep into uh, getting those email marketing campaigns done. Um, check out my email marketing workshop. And the other thing I want to say before I open up to questions is 
uh, Jim and I have been just starting to go down the rabbit hole, I will say, but it's really not a rabbit hole, of uh, something, a, a software called Chat uh, PGPT, which, well, which I looked up yesterday means guide pattern test or table or something like that. Anyway, it is an artificial intelligence program. Um, it's, it's, it just came out in, I think, November, so it's pretty new. It's free. Um, you can go to open.ai. That's the company that, that wrote the software. But it's a really, really powerful way to help you start creating some content. It is an artificial intelligence uh, program where you would write a request or a, have a question, and then it will write a response for you. So I've been, I've only been using it for three days, but yesterday I, um, I've, I've been watching some videos and I went in and I asked it. So I, I, I do a podcast and usually when I, uh, when I release an episode every Monday, I release an episode, I write very short show notes and I usually just tell, you know, what it's about a paragraph about what it's about. And then like a bullet points of like the three or four things we covered in that episode. So I took that information and I said, go, and it, it understands things like what a podcast is and all that. I said, go write show notes for my podcast, Break Through Your Profit Ceiling podcast. And it went and it wrote a whole page of co copy for me. Like it is an, an amazing. So if you're thinking, I really want to do some market email marketing. And you're like, I don't know what to talk about. That might be a great tool for you to, to start doing some, um, some experimentation on the things that you might want to talk about. So for me, I might go in there and say, uh, what, what are email marketing automation best practices? And it'll give me a list of 10 of them. And then I might go in and say, one of them is, um, be consistent and, you know, you need eight to 10 emails so I can write that in there. And it's a conversation and it remembers what you asked. So it's a conversation. Well, can you tell me more about this particular aspect of email marketing? And I'll write a whole bunch of stuff for you. So I'll, and then I'll, I'll, I'll open up for questions, but I'll say one more thing about that. Um, it's, it's fairly generic. If you're going to ask generic questions. Um, I would never use that content straight out of the out of the box. I would always edit it to make it sound like me. I would never use that content on a website or anywhere where Google's going to look at it because I personally believe that Google's going to ding you for having artificial intelligence. And if they don't know how to figure that out yet, they will because it's such new technology because Google is a direct competitor for uh, chat GPT. So um, I, I would use it in things like emails because that's not going to be searched. Um, I'd use it to like Jim and I were talking yesterday. I have a woman who wants me to write this book and I already have five books. I don't really want to write another book, uh, but she really wants me to write this book because she wants me to be part of her tribe and she wants to promote it. And so I'm thinking I might actually use this as a starter point to start the book because it will start giving me some generic content that I can then add my special intellectual property, special secret sauce to, but at least it gives me a place to start. All right. So I've thrown a lot at you. Do any, any of you guys have any questions or comments? Thank you so much. That was a little overwhelming. Uh, <laughs> that was wow. <laughs> but I have wow. a question about um, like when you're tagging people, you can actually like, are you sending in your campaigns people are at different levels it's like so in other words someone responded to your irresistible offer for free content or whatever it was and then you tag them and send them the next step and then they respond to that and then however that works are people in your campaign at different levels of engagement with you yes so jim opts in on monday so that campaign starts for him so he gets all those emails on the pace that I've asked him to do. So let's say three weeks down the road, he's on email number one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, right? Because he's gone through two in the first week, two in the second mm -hmm. week, then the third week, number five, and then the, the fourth week, number six, exact, for example, right? Then you opt in a week later, you start that same path, but Jim's always going to be a week ahead of you because he opted in a week 
before you. So when you go look at those campaigns, it, it shows you in a flow chart and it'll say, you know, how many people are in queue for that email? And it'll be different for each one because people opt in at different times. And that's why it's so important to know where you're taking people, because otherwise yeah. you're just sending emails so, things so, that aren't connected. That's right. So okay. because let's so if someone opts in for um, which one of you is the realtor? Deborah, 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 what? Yeah, that's me. All right. Um, so let's say somebody you have a list that's uh, people who are new home buyers versus maybe sellers even. Right. So you want to take new home buyers on a journey for new home buyers that might be slightly different, although I suspect you could reuse a lot of that copy, just change it for new home buyers versus second home buyers or vacation home buyers. Right. So you want to create different journeys for those people to go on, although you can see how you would re reuse some of that content, just change it for the type of buyer that it is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in her case or realtors cases, you would have an uh, opt-in for a buyer and then an opt-in for a seller and, and then different content to support them. That's, you know, absolutely it, the value proposition would be different for each one. Absolutely. And with the tools you can, you can really hone down because of the power of tags. Right. So I can put you in all in many, many different categories. So I probably have 30 or so tags, maybe 40 tags. So that, cause when, like I do a holiday promotion every year. So I have a, people that bought my holiday promotion um, in 2020 and I have 2021 and I have 2022. So those are, some of those are the same people, um, but I separated them out because I want to make, and then I have people who were interested and then people who actually bought, right? So if I did a holiday promotion that was free and then I sold, tried to sell them something, they go into, they bought the, the thing. So it's really powerful to use that segmentation to really understand who's in your database and really target them. Right. So if I send out an email that targets people who are interested in email marketing and I can I can use five different lists if I want, I can consolidate those together. But the, the, and I send them something that's really specific to email marketing, the chances that they open that are greater than my weekly value add email that I send to everybody on my list. Hmm. Yeah. Do you want to go into a little more detail about, um, let's say we network, um, any of us are in BNI um, or Chambers or that kind of thing, and we get a, a shoebox filled with <laughs> business cards. But let's just say the, the most recent five business cards, talk about how do we get them in the system? And then how do we, what are, what are the compliance issues we should worry about? And how do we get permission? Yeah. So um, if I, I go to an event, I'm going to an event at lunch today and let's say I meet, it's a women's thing. So let's say I meet five women who have said, I'm interested in what you have. Typically I would gear them towards a free thing that I can send them. Right. Because then I have no issues with compliance because I'm sending them something that they want. So usually I try to get them figure out what I have that they want. That's a free thing that I can send them through email. So then that starts them on that journey because I, all of my free things have an automation that's 12 to 18 emails. Right. So that gets them in my world. And I let them know, I'm, I usually do a weekly value added email. I'm going to add you to that list as well. And if they decide they want to unsubscribe, that's fine. Um, but I, I let them know that. And then I go and I will, physically go and enter them into my, um, into, no, no, I won't. Well, two things. If it's the opt-in, I'll go in through my opt-in and I'll actually fill it out for them so that I don't have to go in and manually add them. Right. So I have an opt-in page that says, give me Janet, you know, Janet at breakaway And then I'll, that person will get the deliverable. 
But if I just meet somebody who says, hey, Jan, I'm interested in learning more about what you do, then I will physically go in and add them to the database and I'll put in their name and their their, their email address. And that'll be, just be in the general. Um, I don't... I don't do the double opt-in thing. I, I don't know that anybody does that anymore. I don't really worry about spam because these are people who have said, I want to learn more about what you do. What I wouldn't do is go to an event where I get a whole bunch of cards of people. Like I, I hate to go to those events where people like just give out cards. Like I don't, I'm not interested in that. I need to have a conversation with them. In that case, I wouldn't put those people in my database unless I had a conversation with them where they knew because I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to get dinged for spam or or anything like anything like that. And I don't want unsubscribes. So, you know, unsubscribes are not a bad thing. But if you put a whole bunch of people in your database that don't care about what you have, you're going to get up subscribes and you don't really want you want to minimize that as much as you can. That's that such a good question? point. I've never thought of opting in for them, but if it's a free gift and they want it, it's uh, providing a service and then you can follow up for them. And, and you know, if we send a link via email for them to opt in, I don't know, eight out of 10 aren't going to That's right. opt in. That's right. There and, is also, a, like I was in an <laughs> event um, a couple of weeks ago and I and it was a it was one of those events where people had booths. So I went around to each one of them and talked about, you know, what I do. I run eWomen Network, which is a local networking, um, you know, organization. And so I went to each one of them and I got, got all of their cards. And then what I did is I immediately emailed them and said, it was great meeting you yesterday or Monday on Saturday. It was great meeting you. Um, I reminded them who I was. And then I invited them to look at our website and come to an event. Right. So if I do meet people, um, those people, I'm probably not going to put in my database. I'm just going to email them. And then if they are interested, then I'll put them. But I didn't feel like any of those conversations were strong enough where I was going to put them in my database. I'm just emailing them and starting that conversation. Yeah, I'm hearing just a, a ton of great tips for building a quality list, not a quantity list. Absolutely. You absolutely do. I, 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 I couldn't like reiterate that more. I know a lot of people like look at their list and they say it's not, you know, very big. Um, but it, it doesn't matter. Like the fact that I get a 40%, if I send a targeted email about email marketing, I usually get a 40 to 40% open rate. I'd rather have that than a 10% open rate with twice as many people, right? Cause these are people that want what I have and um, are interested in, in the things that I do. I wanna say one other thing, um, social media. So I love social media. I'm big in um, Instagram. Um, social media is great. And I have a lot of people are like, I have, well, I have 8,600 connections in LinkedIn. Do I get any business from LinkedIn? No. Do I spend much time there? No. So if I did, maybe I would get more business, um, but, a lot of people talk about how many likes they have or how many followers they have. And I think that's awesome. And that's great, but that's not like an email address. So if you are out on social media and you have a big presence, I would encourage you to offer up your free irresistible offers so that they get into your email list because one TikTok could go away tomorrow, right? There's a lot of things people talk about TikTok and it may go away tomorrow or Facebook could sit, could, could throw you off their platform tomorrow because they think you did something right. Then all of those likes or followers or whatever gone, you can never get them back. You can't, you know, contact them, but once you have an email address, they can, they can unsubscribe, but now you have the power and the control of how you want to interact with those people because you have their email address. Anything else? Janet, this was fabulous. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Um, a ton of valuable information. And, you know, you've been there, you've tried it, you've, you know, learned from what works, what doesn't work. And thank you so much for sharing this so thoroughly and transparently. Um, I'm so glad we recorded this uh, because uh, many of us will have to watch this again. 
Um, so I'll send the recording out to everybody, including Janet. And awesome. Um, I I noticed Corinne was um, snapping <laughs> photos of your slides. Would you be willing to share your slides? Yeah, I'll us? send them to you. Okay, great. I'll, I'll share those as well. Um, anybody have any other questions? I oh, so uh, um, Brett, I heard they were going to charge forty dollars a month. Um, but I would pay. Yeah. I would. Eat, I would gladly pay twenty or forty dollars a month for what I'm getting from it. Uh, yeah, you're talking about Chat GPT. Maybe I heard wrong. I heard it secondhand. I and I I I know I heard it somewhere. I don't know where I heard it either. So, but I, uh, I know there's with, a. What's well, that? They, uh, whatever they do charge, I still think now is the best time to try to start learning it while it's still free, so you can decide if it's uh, worth. It. I totally I totally agree. Um, I watched a couple of videos. Um, I don't remember the guy's name. Of I watched one long video on YouTube that I thought was really good. It was like 39 minutes long. And I don't remember the guy's name, but what I really gleaned from that is the prompts that you put in, make all the difference in what you're going to get out. And I know that makes that, that sounds pretty obvious, but it wasn't obvious to me when I first started playing around with it. Cause all of my prompts were pretty generic, but you can put in like what he did. He went and one of his, um, he went into YouTube and he got the transcript from a video, which was really long. And he put that whole transcript in chat GPT and then asked it to summarize the, oh. the thing. And he had, wow. and then it didn't do it exactly right. Or there are a couple of things that he wanted it to do. So he just asked it to do it in a different way. And it did. I mean, so it took a couple of iterations. So it's really, really powerful. And like I said, what I walked away from is um, what you, you, the prompts that you put in are really, can be really powerful in what you get out. Yeah, the, the questions you ask, the prompts, the, and the sequence, the order that you ask them in. And we did that in our last group coaching session. And I'll, uh, I'll edit that video and send it out as well. But those are, those are, I mean, just to, to build on what Janet has shared, artificial intelligence, if you think it's scary or dangerous or weird, um, that's fine. Um, it's something new and, and getting used to something new is usually scary, but this is a train that we want to get on. Like Brett, Brett said, it's never going to be cheaper than their first offer. And for example, um, I charge 300 bucks an hour for business coaching one-to-one. And that's a totally fair rate. People get five to 10 times return on investment for that. If I'm writing an article, it can take me an hour and a half to two hours. But if I do research with artificial intelligence and ask a series of questions and then edit it, you know, copy paste, reword it in, in my own voice, I could probably do that in about 20 minutes. So the value of our time is so incredible. And I just wanted to give that revenue model really quickly to put the $40 or $50 or $100 in perspective for us is content marketing is not going to go away, but it's going to be how do we use this? How do we use this intelligence yeah. for our benefit? Yeah, and I, I would I would get on it sooner rather than later. One, because it's free now. Uh, two, this is not going to go away. So I think the quicker we learn how to use it effectively, the better off we're all going to be. Because most people probably won't ever figure out how to use it really effectively. So I think getting getting into that earlier is a is a is a, is a benefit to us um, as far as figuring out how to how to utilize it. And then I would say, but I would also once again reiterate, I wouldn't take the take the stuff that comes out of it and put it anywhere that gets Google looked at by Google. There are two, um, there are two programs and I, I, that will actually, you can actually, one of them is, and it was so funny because I saw it on, I was doing research yesterday on this. 
because I'm actually going to release an episode of my podcast next week on this. So I was doing some research and there's a guy from Princeton who's like 21 years old who wrote this a program where you can take the information that comes out of chat GPT or any of the artificial intelligence uh, engines and put it in there and then submit it. And it will tell you whether it's written by a human or written by artificial intelligence. So if you are going to take something and you're going to put it somewhere that might get Googled, um, then I would put it through one of these and his is called GPT zero dot M E. And I don't, remember what the other one was called i don't even know if i wrote it down um the other one is called ai text classifier so if you are going to do that i and these things are just new so they're not very accurate right at the moment um but if you are going to do you may want to test it to see whether it's looks like it's written by artificial intelligence or it looks like it's written by a human. Yeah, thank you, Janet. And I think you could you could do Google searches on, um, well, teachers teachers are using this to see if people are doing book reports right. or, or other things with AI or if they're actually writing it themselves. Um, so it's, it's, again, not something that's gonna go away and it's just gonna get better and, and more accurate. Um, Janet, from setting setting a great example of irresistible giveaways, do you and and being on list? Do you have something to offer us as a group? Or you mentioned breakawaybusinesscoaching.com forward slash email marketing workshop for uh, yeah, that's for a paid thing. Workshop, right? Um, so the, I have a master class. Um, and I don't know that I don't have the link to it right in front of me, but can I send it to you, Jim, and you send it out yes. to everybody? Yep, absolutely. And I'll put yeah. it in, um, a tip for any of you that are doing YouTube videos is to put links in your description field. And so I'll put it in the Janet's link for that in the description field of this video. Awesome. Okay. Anybody watching so this? Video? I will. So you need, I need to send you the um the slides and the link to the master class anything else that i said i would get you i think that's it all right i'll I, like i said i'll send that link to you and i'll send you the um the slides and the other thing i want you guys to know is uh oh uh, janet and i have been talking and we've been talking about ai and we've been talking about email marketing for weeks and I just had this gut feeling like this is so important. We need to jump on both of these. Every single business owner should be doing email marketing. And Janet's really niched down and been studying this. And, and as you can see, is an incredible expert at this. And I asked her to be a guest speaker on our group coaching call last night. At yeah, like five four o'clock. Five o'clock. Four o'clock. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't five. It was four. <laughs> yeah. So I want to just thank you deeply and congratulate you on a tremendous job in short mm -hmm. notice. Oh, thank you. I can talk about this stuff for forever and ever and ever. <laughs> so thank awesome. you for well, having me. And and Jim, sorry for coming, not figuring out how to get on and sorry for not sending you my bio to this morning. I was like, in fact, I never got my tea because I went to make tea and I'm like, oh, shoot, I didn't send him the bio. So I came in here and then I never got my tea. So I guess I'll have my tea now. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you, Janet. And have a wonderful couple of weeks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you.